Coach, why was Matt Stafford the right guy for this team? Yeah, I think um, you know, it's good to see you, Maria. You know, first of all, you know, he's a great competitor, plays the position at an elite level. I think for anybody that's been around him, you know, when you talk to those people, they say about him that says as much as anything and then just being able to evaluate his body back to Georgia uh, you know the 12 years in Detroit uh, toughness sees the field well can progress great movement in the pocket can make all those throws and then you know I think um, you know just being able to get to know him a little bit just he's got a great way about himself where you can feel he's got a great quiet confidence but a humility that's refreshing uh, I think his teammates are really going to love him you, you listen to what some of his teammates have come out and said uh, about him. And that's really consistent with whether it's coaches, teammates, uh, you can't help but love this guy and really excited to get to work with Matthew. Kurt. Hey, Sean, good to see you again. Good to see you, Kurt. I don't know if it's accurate to say uh, square peg, square, square hole. What does he do that fits your offense? Uh, I'm assuming, it, 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 and no disrespect to Jared, I have great respect for Jared. Don't want to make it about Jared, but what does Matthew do to make your offense stronger? Yeah, you know, I, I would say this, Kurt. You're talking about two uh, really good quarterbacks in this league. There's, there's only 32 in the world, and both those guys are in that category. So I think you're talking about special people in general. Um, but I think, you know, our job as coaches is always to fit your offense and your system to the skill sets of your players. And that always starts with, with the quarterback. Um, you know, a lot of the things that, that you might see us do are reflected in what he's had success with. You know, so it's not about, you know, what the Rams have done. It's about building this thing around our players, uh, our coaches. We're really excited about that. But I just think the, the things that you've seen from Matthew over the course of his career – playing the position at an elite level, the way he's able to see the field. You know, you, you see, um, you know, Rodgers, Mahomes have done an outstanding job of being able to move and manipulate coverage and, and change their arm slots. And, and Matthew's done a lot of those same things. And so I think he's got great wide field vision, sees the field. He's able to speed it up if he has issues. You know, you're watching a guy that if you watch the film, the game makes sense to him. And um, I really uh, respect the lens that he sees it through being able to start talking a little bit with him. Um, you get some really insight into the way that he sees the game and the thinking of it, but uh, it shows up on the film and, and we're excited whenever that chance presents itself to be able to get to work. I, I don't want to make one game a decision, but obviously the loss of the Packers, when you guys were in position to take that lead, and then here you have Matthew Stafford, a guy who's really known for uh, fourth quarter comebacks. Am I making too much of that, or is that part of the equation? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, I thought Jared played well in that game, Kurt. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that go into it. And I think most importantly, it's a rare opportunity to acquire a player of, of Matthew Stafford's caliber. Um, you know, it's, it's really unprecedented when you look at kind of what's happening with the landscape of the league and, and possible franchise guys that are moving and changing teams. And to be able to acquire somebody like him was an opportunity that – we wanted to be aggressive about pursuing it. And, uh, you know, fortunately it worked out, but um, by no means is it a reflection of not uh, respecting and appreciating all the great things that Jared Goff has done. Um, you know, you just see the way he handles himself and um, you know, he's nothing but class and, and he'll do a great job for Detroit. Thank you. You're welcome. Claudia. Sean, in Detroit, Stafford will average 280 to 300 yards passing per game. Do you expect to see that get even higher? Or do you think his touchdown to interception ratio will improve as well? Yeah, I think uh, the first part, I'll be able to answer your question that I, I don't know. I think Zach Robinson and Matthew Stafford have connected now that I can answer that from uh, your previous uh, press conference, Claudia. But with regards to the stats, um, you know, our job is to win football games and his job is to be able to lead uh, our team to victories and produce offensively, score a bunch of points. He's definitely shown the resilience and the competitiveness to be able to bring his team from behind. But um, turnovers are a big part of this thing. You always want to do a great job taking care of the football while also competing and, and giving yourself an opportunity to create explosives. 
Uh, I think he's really done a great job of that the last handful of years, and, and we're excited about being the best offense we can be with him uh, at the switch. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Eric. Hey, Sean. Good to see you again. Hey, Eric. Hey, um, what are the important first steps in kind of building this relationship with Matthew so you guys can get going quickly? This is a new offense, he said, much different than the one he ran with Daryl Bevel. So I imagine there's going to, going to be a couple of things you need to do early to kind of get things going. Yeah. I, you know, I think the, you know, the exciting thing, Eric, is we've got some, some things that we're doing different and, and really whether it's onboarding a, a new quarterback or, you know, a new offensive line coach, there's a lot of things that you've got to figure out what's the best way to operate with this offense in the upcoming season. And I think you start from ground one, uh, you get to know one another, you really build a foundational relationship. Uh, and it's really, truly a collaboration. And, and I think when you look at what he's done really over the last couple of years, you know, Matthew's had so many different experiences and exposures. So we can kind of speak, I, you know, I would imagine once we were able to get going, you know, he'll be able to speak the same language because I know Coach Bevel has some similar foundational, you know, whether it's how you call formations, how do you utilize the snap count. Even when Joe Lombardi was his offensive coordinator, we've got a lot of similar things that we believe in from, what coach Payton in the new Orleans system has done such an excellent job of. So he's got a lot of things that, that he's experienced that we'll quickly figure out what is that way that we can communicate. And, you know, we've studied a bunch of his tape as well, Eric, and, and you'll see us implement things that he's comfortable with, even if it's stuff that you haven't maybe seen from the Rams. Uh, I think everything starts with that quarterback and that's exactly what this process will be reflective of. So quick follow up coach. So you are asking him kind of what he liked to do in the past and, and potentially implementing some of those things in your offense? When we can start talking ball, we'll be able to absolutely do those <laughs> things. <laughs> Thanks, Coach. <laughs> Gary? Hey, this, hey Sean, uh, Les, this is for, for both of you. And since this is the first time, really, we've had an opportunity that you guys have an opportunity to talk about, um, Jared. Um, at, at what point... Did each of you or collectively, did you guys lose confidence in his ability to take you guys to the next level and decided that you needed to go a different direction? Yeah, I don't think there was ever a moment, you know, that that's that's not what this situation reflects. I will say this, Gary, we got to speed up your unmute. You're like 12 <laughs> seconds in, in between every single question. A little more urgency. I'm going to stop talking to you. All right. But um, no, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think Gary kind of at the beginning when we started talking about it is, um, you know, to be able to acquire a player of Matthew Stafford's caliber. Those are things that really, you know, since I've been coaching in the NFL, I haven't seen opportunities like that come up often. Um, and to be able to take advantage of that, to be in alignment with Les and, uh, and you know, and, and Kevin and Tony, and then to have uh, ownership, be able to support uh, our decisions is, is something that you're truly grateful for and you want to work hard to make them right on it. But it's more of a reflection of the, you know, opportunity to acquire Matthew than anything else. Les? Uh, yeah, similar answer. Uh, key, key words, opportunity, rare opportunity. Uh, put simply right, uh, chance to uh, – Bet on going from good to great at that position, and especially from where our team was, our, our core group of players, where they were in their career, uh, the coaching staff we have felt like it was just too uh, good of an opportunity to pass up. And, and then Les, you know, you spoke about how, you know, having to have conversations with Dan Kroenke. How does that conversation go? I mean, Jared's a guy you gave up Two first round picks to draft you're giving up two first round draft picks to trade you've invested you know convinced him to invest 110 million dollars in him and now you're now you're going to trade him so can you take us through how that conversation goes with with upper management the, the one thing uh sean and i uh have discussed amongst ourselves many times is we appreciate uh stan allowing us uh to be intentional about trying to improve, uh, let's call it Sunday afternoons, and 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 some and not necessarily uh, the uh, spreadsheet per se. But with that being said, you know the even 
it, it's not like that's a very simple way to say, all right, we gave, you know, Jared this amount of money. You're still, you're going to, you're going to save some because of Matt's contracts and things like that. So those things sitting down with Tony and, and Kevin and walking through ownership, right. The exact details of financials and, and things like that uh, all occur. And again, I think would reiterate, uh, really appreciate uh, being a part of an organization, being a, you know, uh, Sean and I being a steward for uh, Stan's franchise in terms of his goal and his vision. And he's always allowed us to try to do what's best to uh, improve Sunday afternoons. And then finally um, for Sean, you know, Jordan asked, um, Matthew about different comebacks and which ones were memorable. And he, he mentioned one against Washington when you were coaching there. Uh, do you have recollection of that? And, and if you do, what are your memories of that game? Yeah, he broke my heart, Gary. It was <laughs> after he beat the Rams and you guys went to London. So uh, Kirk Cousins scored on his own read to take the lead. I thought the game was over. Makes a couple unbelievable throws and then he knifes a seam to Anquan Bolden right over the top of us in a buzz coverage. And, uh, it was a tough day, uh, but uh, it was one of those things where you witness it. And, you know, Coach, uh, Coach Morris and I talked about that. He broke Raheem's heart this past year as well in a two-minute situation. And so uh, resilient, competitor, all those things. I, I do remember those, uh, those tough days, but you can't help but respect and appreciate just the caliber of competitor and that, that belief that he instills in everybody around him because he's got the tangible evidence to reflect that with some of the results. And, you know, to, to the question that you asked Les as well, Gary, I do think it's really important to acknowledge how fortunate we both feel to work for Stan Kroenke. You know, the willingness to have us be able to articulate some of the thought processes behind, you know, why we felt like this was a good decision and then to have the trust from him and the support. Those are things that you never take for granted. It makes you want to work that much harder to, uh, you know, to continue to, uh, you know, make, you know, make him look good with being able to trust us to make some of these decisions. It's never a perfect thing, but when you have that belief from ownership and that support, man, is that something that you don't take for granted and, and feel so grateful. And I know Les and I both share in that sentiment. Thanks very much. Jordan. Hey guys, how you doing? Jordan. Good Jordan. Hey Les, uh, Real quick, what's your what's your cap number right now? What is that? I I would I'm pleading ignorant. I don't have <laughs> next to me under one eighty two five. Oh, you, I mean that's I don't know where we're at. I thought you were asking where we exactly are. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm asking. That is the, that is the ceiling, right? <laughs> I have to try. I don't know exactly what our total number is uh, at this point in time. Thanks. Had had to try that one. Um, both of you guys, and, and um, thanks, Gary, for, for um, sending my question earlier. Um, what does it say about somebody's make, makeup to um, execute that kind of a two-minute, to execute those kind of um, back-breaking, heart-breaking situations if you're on the other side of it? Go ahead, Les. Hey, uh, I, uh, what was your question again, Jordan? I was, uh, I, I was asking about the uh, the game winning situations and the fourth quarter comebacks, um, and what does it mean about a guy's makeup and about sort of his mental makeup um, and fiber to be able to execute what is a sort of a backbreaker situation if you're on the other side of it? Yeah, it would be awesome if 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 we did have uh, some tool to measure that in in every player, especially quarterbacks, right? <laughs> Uh, ultimately, the only way we can measure it right, is, is those particular individuals that that have those opportunities on stage. And, and if I go to a golf analogy, right, it's, it's different, uh, you know, playing a major on, on Sunday afternoon than it is on, on Thursday. And, and there's a set of uh, human beings that can handle that pressure, that thrive under that pressure, because, uh, right, the, the windows get tighter, the uh, the putts seem longer, but they uh, seem to be able to uh, consistently, uh, when that situation arises, uh, to 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 go and break uh, people like Sean's heart uh, when he was offense coordinator at Kirk Cousins. And what's interesting about the momentum is 
I think uh, when you have those type of players, I think when we watch games as fans on Sundays or Mondays or Thursdays, when, when a Matthew Stafford, when an Aaron Rodgers, uh, when some of those players, when a Tom Brady, you, you take the lead and, and, and you kick off and they got one more series, uh, everyone from everyone in the stands, opposing and home team, uh, you know, uh, the announcers, whatever, are, are thinking, uh-oh, don't know, bet you that team wishes they hadn't kicked off. So uh, it's why, uh, you know, coaching staffs would love to be able to, to, to execute that four to six minute uh, offense and getting victory instead of kicking off to players like Matt and, and some of the others who have proven over time. Yeah, Jordan, I think what's so impressive about those situations as well is when you are very regulated and predictable in terms of what kind of plays you're activating offensively. You're in a known passing situation, even though you might have four downs if you're playing for a touchdown or if you're trying to get in field goal range. Um, you know, just the intricacies of what that entails, just playing the position, moving, manipulating the way that these guys rush now, the way that you see on stop clock, some of these pressures, even you got teams now being able to get to exotic running clock pressures. And so I think just being able to play that position with the type of pressure in those circumstances, you know, you talk about mental toughness, being your best when your best is required, that competitive greatness. Those are all the things that that reflects. And that's what's so exciting. And uh, you definitely don't ever feel like it's too big for him. You know, like I, I think a lot of people will make certain expectations when you acquire a player of Matthew, but um, you know, he's just about going to work, trying to influence and affect this team and his teammates the right way, try to win and, and be where your feet are planted. And, and that's what, uh, you know, I'm so excited about getting the opportunity to go to work with him. Yeah, and then I would say this, Hey Jordan, the interesting add to is a lot of times with quarterbacks, you don't find out that until they get to the NFL because from high school to college, they're rarely, they're rarely behind at the end of the game. You know, usually their team's up by a lot. Right, because they were, you know, elite talents at the, that high school, college level. So, and then uh, just one more for, for you, Sean. Um, what can we learn from uh, some of the things that you did in that Week 17 game? Um, I remember you you talked a lot about um, the way that that John was working out of structure, uh, navigating the pocket, finding throwing lanes. What sort of things can we learn about your direction? from what you guys were able to do in that game? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, it, that's that was with John leading the, the way. You know, you saw us activate some different ways to run him and take advantage of his athleticism. I think really the play that got John going in that game was the scramble on the third and long, creating it with his legs. And so, um, you know, Matthew brings, uh, you know, the ability to extend plays and, and create with his legs. But in a lot of instances, some of the unique things he's done are, are creating off schedule by moving, manipulating and, and staying in the pocket. But he still, you know, can put it down uh, and be able to make plays with his legs. So I, I think those are things that we're excited about learning. You know, the more that I've studied him, you know, you've always had an appreciation for him from afar, but then when you really say, all right, let's, let's cut up every single throw for the last handful of years. Let's, let's really implement, let's, let's be able to think about, you know, activating some of these concepts that we're seeing him consistently have success with. That's going to be an ongoing and evolving process uh, as we gear towards whenever, you know, our opener is. And, and that's why you're hopeful that you can have an off season program. And if not, then we'll operate the same way that everybody else will be forced to. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. You got it. Lindsay. Hey guys, thanks for doing this. Um, for both of you, going back to kind of Gary's question, uh, was there a point, um, with, notwithstanding the, the Matthew Stafford trade, I mean, obviously he became available and that was a unique move to make, but before Matthew Stafford became available after the season, neither one of you provided a vote of confidence for Jared Goff um, when it came to the long-term future with the team. So was there a point during the last couple of years when you started to lose confidence in what you could do for your team? Give me open. Yeah, go ahead. Donna, you want? Go ahead, Les. Oh, I think the, the uh, even after the season two, very similar to, uh, to the Matthew Stafford situation, I think uh, Sean being able to work with uh, – John Wofford in that that element of mobility and what that added to the offense probably led to uh, some of that as well. But uh, it was it was mainly opportunity, and I, I'll say this on yes, just like myself as a 
general manager, you'd love to have a few decisions back. I'm sure Jared would love to have, uh, you know, a few throws back along the way. But at the end of the day, right, uh, you know, since drafting Jared uh, has been a part of winning a lot of games, a lot of success around here. So the big the big things that, that occurred was John Wofford, his mobility, what that added uh, to Sean's toolbox, and then the opportunity to, to uh, acquire a proven QB with a lot of experience. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, the, everybody wants to pinpoint a moment. That, that, that's, that's there, there's not. There's so many things that go into these things, Lindsay. There's, I think it's the most difficult position in all of sports. Um, you know, what I will say is when you really step back, you take the emotions out of it and you're really able to evaluate the entirety of it. You know, I, I stand by the things that I said, you know, when we last spoke about, you know, you can't deny the resume and the production and the leadership and everything that he's done that's good. I think that's important to reflect. And I think he's earned that. And, um, you know, on a real positive, which what I think was really impressive is when you look at his last couple games to come in uh, right after, you know, he had recently gotten a thumb surgery to help lead us to a victory against the Seahawks, knowing what a tough team they are. And then I thought he played really well against Green Bay. You know, there weren't as many opportunities. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple things, you know, somebody, you know, Kirk asked earlier about, you know, when we ended up making it a one possession game, our defense gets a stop. You know, he makes a good decision on a first down and we drop a ball. And, and I think, you know, maybe you're driving and you possibly score and, it changes some things as far as, you know, the outcome of that game, but, you know, Green Bay is a great team, but I thought Jared played really well. I thought he saw the field well, made good decisions. And um, there definitely wasn't like anything in particular, uh, you know, you're always accumulate, you know, you're always evaluating the entirety with that body of work. And, and there's so many things that go into that, um, you know, day in and day out. Les kind of said it, but Sean, is there, um, an, when you had the opportunity to play John Wolford, did that kind of give you a new scope of, of what maybe you wanted a new way to look at the quarterback position for you going forward? And considering John Wolford, if he had been available in that final playoff game, would you have started him? Yeah, I, what I would say is, um, you know, with, with John, you know, it's a different player. You know, the same ways that uh, when I was in Washington and you work with Kirk Cousins or Colt McCoy or Robert Griffin, you know, then you come here and you work with Jared, you know, you're always shaping things around that player. And kind of like what I mentioned earlier, John brings an element of athleticism and the ability to activate him as a runner, which can change the math in your favor offensively with a lot of the ways that defenses try to defend you. Um, you know, we're not going to be running too many zone reads with Matthew Stafford. I can promise you that, but um, it's all about just getting to know. I, I think when you look at what Matthew's done over the course of his career, you know, we're going to shape the offense to to our players, and and he's going to be a huge part of that. And you know, we're in the process of doing that right now, and and that's why you're hopeful that you can have a you know an off season to be able to get that thing started. And just last one for me, Les. Um, do you feel like as a general manager, you did enough to put pieces around Jared Goff for him to be successful? At times, definitely we we had pieces, but as a general manager, you're going to always remember the the losses or maybe the the seasons that didn't go quite as well as uh, envisioned when the season started. So uh, that's always, that's always a model that is adjusting and, and things like that. But I, I do think uh, as we've seen over the years uh, on, on that side of the ball and, 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 and partnering Jared with Sean, his staff and, and, you know, a lot of those uh, core players on the offensive side of the ball over the last four years, they've done things that are, you know, probably better. I mean, there, I would say a lot of top five, top three, top four, top two type uh, data that they've all produced. So uh, give those guys credit. Thanks. Great. Hey guys, uh, Les, can, can you tell us a little bit about the decision to trade Michael Brockers, uh, why you decided to do that, how tough it was to trade the first guy you ever drafted and how you weighed everything that he brings to the team versus I, I assume salary cap relief. Uh, yeah. You, I mean, yeah. Interestingly, right. This is, as we say around here, right. It's, it's we over me, but if you take the me for a moment, uh, myself as an individual, I've, I've always said it, it, it would be like uh, you as a, probably a rookie investor uh, and, and, and picking uh, a, a blue chip stock that just kept, kept uh, returning 
a lot of awesome dividends. But at the end of the day, did try to work with with Mike to to restructure, uh, and wasn't able to get that done. And uh, you know, he because of who he is and, and how he still plays, uh, was able to find a home so he so he could go and and move on and continue his career. Hines uh, wanted to you know extend his contract and things like that. So we tried to find a win win for both, uh, you know, the Rams and Michael in that situation. But yes, it de de definitely did have uh, to do with, with cap. And Sean, uh, you've lost four defensive starters and another, another key rotation guy on the defensive line all in the last few days, combined with the coaching overhaul on that side of the ball. Is this, is this going to be a step back, step back for the Rams with everything? Well, that happened? You know, I don't think you would ever look at it, Greg. You've always got to have contingency plans in place. You know, you lose great coaches, but you, you bring in who you think are great coaches. And so, you know, when you've got foundational pieces like Aaron Donald, like Jalen Ramsey, um, you see the ascension of some of these younger players, you know, you, you, you're able to re-sign Leonard Floyd, you know, moving on from, you know, first of all, those guys that you mentioned, you know, you talk about John Johnson, what he's meant to this organization, um, since he got here from day one, the impact, the leadership, all those things, the caliber of player he is, the playmaker, the versatility, you know, the Browns are getting a great one, as are the Browns getting in Troy Hill, you know, a really productive playmaker that can play inside and outside. You see him score three touchdowns this year. Those are two big losses on the back end, and John was able to do – both those guys really were able to play multiple spots on the back seven. Uh, and then you talk about Michael Brockers and, and, and what an unbelievable leader he's been. You know, I, I went on and on about how great it was to be able to have him. I stand by those comments. That's what's been so difficult about, you know, the uncertainty behind coming after a pandemic where you're projecting a lot of things. You got to figure out ways to make it all fit with the puzzle. Uh, and Michael was a part of that puzzle moving forward. Unfortunately, we couldn't come to an agreement. And, and that's really a, a credit to the caliber of player that he still is and, and what he's doing. But he will be missed. And then Morgan Fox, what, what an awesome deal for him to, to earn the right to go do his deal in, in Carolina. The versatility that he demonstrated was really instrumental in our success. But what that means is you're counting on some young guys to step up. You know, you look at Darius Williams, we, we wouldn't, you know, he's done an outstanding job that you tender him as a one, which is, you know, what we felt like uh, his worth was to us. Um, you're going to ask some guys like David Long to really step up, you know, when you lose a Troy Hill. Uh, you, you invest in the safety position the last couple of years with Taylor Rapp, Terrell Burgess. We saw what Jordan Fuller was able to do. Those are three guys that we're very excited about. And then we've got some young guys up front. You know, we had signed Sean Robinson last year as a result of what we thought was losing Michael Brockers. He had some situations and we're excited about the development for him. And I think Sebastian Joseph Day is a guy that continues to show uh, why he is a special interior player. And, um, you know, those are the guys that are going to be asked to step up. So to say you're going to take a step back, it's too much work to go that goes into it. There's too many people I still have confidence in while not minimizing the huge impact that those four players that you mentioned, Greg, um, you know, had on the success of our defense in particular last year. Mark. Yeah, Les, I wanted, I wanted to know what you remembered about scouting Stafford. I know he was the number one pick overall. And I don't know how much time you evaluated him, but any, any, uh, any memories from, from going down to Georgia and seeing him? The, uh, I do know the, the memory that always sticks out uh, at that particular time uh, with the Falcons had Matt Ryan. Uh, so obviously weren't in the, in the uh, let's call it franchise quarterback market. And I think he went one overall, so we weren't picking that low. But I do, I do remember uh, Atlanta's, a, especially our facility. I think Lindsay knows that. She was there, Flowery Branch. It's a, probably about a 30 minute drive to Athens. Uh, I can promise you this, you'll, you'll probably get a ticket on the way. So the drive will end up being about 50 minutes. Uh, it was always a, a great speed trap. But at, rolling over to that pro day, it was probably in my time. Uh, I wasn't at the Sam Bradford pro day, uh, but uh, probably the best pro day from a quarterback standpoint. We obviously being in Atlanta, uh, it's, it's dog country. You, you watched, uh, Matt, whether it's live games or, or uh, on television from afar as a fan, as a as a NFL executive, what have you. But I just remember that pro day, that ball was coming all, you know, out of his wrist 
uh, with a lot of velocity, a lot of accuracy, and it and it it's something that uh, it's it stamped in my brain for, and it's still there. Also, Sean, this you, know, you could feel that ball. You're like, okay, yeah. this, this is different. This yeah. is different. Sean, there's been so much uh, instability in the quarterback position throughout the league. I mean, even in, in Jared's, you know, the first two guys in Jared's draft aren't where they are were, and especially with with players picked high and you just alluded to the fact that it was such a difficult position. Why is it, why do you think there's so much instability and why do you think it's become so much more difficult to evaluate? It seems like over the years. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, and then you can talk about guys like the Mahomes, the Rogers, you know, you look at what Tom Brady's doing. So there's a, there's a lot of examples. I, I think it's just what you mentioned, Mark, the difficulty of the position and the caliber of play that uh, you have to display week in and week out to be able to keep up with these defensive players, these coaches, the intricacies of how the game and the landscape of the league has evolved over the last couple of years. And I just think it's, it's such a difficult position to evaluate because so many of the things that, um, you know, are really situationally driven can't be evaluated until you're put in those situations, snap in and snap out. And I think, um, you know, in particular, when you look at Matthew, He's a guy that has had a lot of experience and, and that repetition can be the mother of learning. If you take them the right way, take those experiences, both the good and the bad, you learn from it. Um, when you watch his play, he strikes me as somebody that's absolutely done that. And um, you know, I'm excited about being able to kind of pair up with him and our coaches and the rest of our players and, and figure out uh, you know, how to make us the most explosive and productive offense with, with him guiding the ship. Thank you. All right, guys, and we're, we're going to wrap here with Stu, Kevin, and then Plasky. Morning, Les. Morning, Sean. Um, question for both of you guys. Just with the arrival of Stafford, what, if at all, um, changes from a personnel standpoint as far as, again, within the limitations of the cap and um, drafts, picks, and whatnot, as far as um, players you may potentially add on the offensive side uh, through either avenues, is there anything that – um, you may target, obviously, without tipping your hand to that extent. Seems like if we answered that, we'd be tipping our hand. Fair. But does anything change philosophically as far as just as, as you figure out the way that you want this offense to operate with Stafford under center and how different that might look, um, how that might impact who or what you, you add on that side of the ball besides what you already have? You, you want to open or do you want me to roll? Go ahead, Les. No, I think I think the I think uh, with let's take it with the arrival of Stafford and, and let's say if, if we weren't able to to bring in Matt, I think every year Sean would sit down and, and try to determine and as they work through their cut ups of, of how he wants to evolve the offense and, and maybe uh, what uh, I call it genres of flavors of of players uh, that we might need that might add to uh, his arsenal or, or what he's trying to do. So I, I think you're, you're always going to have to take a step back and go, okay, who do we have? What are we trying to do? Is there uh, anyone or any particular skill set that could uh, add to help us uh, again uh, with the intent of improving on uh, Sunday afternoons? Yeah, a lot of the same. You know, you always look at it and you say, okay, what do we currently have? What do we want to operate what has been consistent with these teams or part of offenses we've been a part of that are able to dictate the terms in terms of being able to run it or throw it, uh, stay in those, you know, manageable situations. And uh, a lot of the things that you want to do in terms of who you want to onboard through those different avenues that you mentioned, Stu, are a product of what do you currently have in place and how do you see the team or the 11 guys on offense fitting together to be the best offense, you know, and, um, you know, I've, I've said it before, football is the ultimate team game. It's the greatest team sport there is. And that's why it's so important to really be able to have depth at all those spots. But then I think skill sets that complement one another so that you can be versatile in terms of what you can activate and the different ways you can apply pressure to defenses. And then bringing back Leonard Floyd, that's obviously a little bit of a departure from kind of the approach you guys have had, at least in years past, to the edge rusher position where you've brought in somebody on, let's say, a one-year deal, for example, what was what's different about Leonard and, and why did you feel like that was the right move for bringing him back and investing in him in the way that you did? I think, uh, Sue, I would, I think the, one of the big reasons, uh, 
Leonard was valuable to us is, is probably in how you asked the question, right? Edge rusher. Uh, we felt like in that position and it evolved there last year, right? It's more than just a, an edge rusher, right? Leonard's a, a special athlete uh, with instincts to, to right, play the run game, set edges, uh, the AA to, to run, uh, let's call it games along that front seven. Uh, and, and you got to be athletic, got to be able to have the instincts to, to run those games, to run those plays and, and have that AA to close and finish those games and be more than just a disruptor. And, and then there's the element of him being able to be a, a tough in coverage uh, and, and someone that quarterbacks have to shoot over because he is tall and long when he does drop back. And, and, and then uh, the guys we're chasing down in our division sometimes, uh, that unique trait, that AA to redirect uh, when all of a sudden the, the play becomes uh, unscheduled and, and then uh, have the speed after he does redirect, go chase him down. So a uh, very versatile player for us and, and more than just an edge rusher, even though all, you know, everyone, all coaches are going to want players to help rush and, and affect the passer. But uh, I think with him, it would be, uh, it definitely uh, should be said that, you know, he, he is a versatile player more than just edge rusher in our minds. Thank you. Yeah, all the same. I mean, he's, it's, it's really uh, jacked up to have him back. You watch his tape and I think he earned that respect across the league with what he did in Chicago, but especially this past year, people that you really value their opinions. I think there was consistency amongst those people that are really studying the film, know what it looks like and, uh, and the way that they saw him a major, major contributor to what we did defensively this past year. All right. Uh, Kevin and Plasty. Good morning guys. Um, Sean, you uh, said it was a rare opportunity to uh, acquire Stafford. Is he unique to the extent that if he hadn't been available, uh, you would still have Jared Goff and be working to make that work? Yeah, it, that's a great question, Kevin. I mean, if, if we didn't, then that I think that'd be the circumstances in the situation that we're in. Um, you know, but, but that did occur. That's kind of where we're at right now. And uh, moving forward with, uh, you know, the anticipation of uh, kind of anxiously awaiting when we can start connecting and doing football together and excited about John Walford, you know, continuing to progress and improve. I think he can really, you know, gain a lot from the experiences that he had. Um, really excited about just that group in general, but, you know, haven't really spent too much time thinking about the what ifs. Uh, it was more of, all right, now it's official and uh, full speed ahead. Here we go. Do you each remember the the moment that you learned that that he was asking to go elsewhere and that he might be available? Uh, yeah, I do. I I, uh, I got a text from uh, some coaches said uh, when it was released. It might have been on your Twitter, Kevin. Somebody I think Schefter tweeted it out or something that uh, he was available and um, you know and then then you know the dialogue starts and. I think things came together probably a lot quicker than anybody could have ever anticipated, but uh, you know, we were pleased with the end result. Les, do you remember? I, if I remember, I do believe it was maybe a Sunday. I'm not sure, but I, I can, I can, I can remember. Uh, and, and because of the relationship with, with Brad and Brad had never uh, told me that was the case, but I do remember breaking when it broke. I, 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 at some point that afternoon, uh, got in touch with Brad, just uh, not necessarily to to dive into the the uh, Matt Stafford sweepstakes per se, because you know we definitely had to have a lot of discussions. But because of that relationship with Brad, I remember maybe a Sunday seeing that break and and uh, calling Brad and going, "Hey, welcome to the you know the uh, the GM club per se." So the Saturday before the Sunday, I mean the Sunday before the Saturday that the deal was. Agreed to. It's been so long ago. I would, if we were in a, if this was court, I would, boy, I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't want to say that if I'd uh, <laughs> took an, uh, an oath, but it does seem like uh, that it, I know this, it happened, it happened very, very, very fast in terms of, uh, uh, and, it, and, it, and it gained momentum in terms of, and I think what, the, I think the, the add to that was, uh, a lot of speculation about quarterbacks uh, this year, as Sean mentioned earlier, but Matt was the one Q to QB that was available. 
not just uh, from a speculative standpoint of being available. So I do think uh, every team that was looking for QBs, whether uh, it was the teams, right, that were picking early in the draft this year and trying to determine, right, it, you know, if they should take the QB or not, or things like that uh, jumped into to that, to that uh, chase of Matt pretty quickly. And there was a lot of, you know, a lot of suitors and a lot of momentum and it gained steam fast. And then just quickly. It even interrupted Sean's vacation. <laughs> I think we, we, we at any point uh, really planned for it to occur that fast. And then just quickly, are you looking to restructure his contract or longer term to uh, put a long-term commitment in, in writing with, uh, with Stafford? I would say, Kevin, we did everything at this point uh, to onboard him without having to do that. I know that there's a, there was, a, there's a, a mechanism and an opportunity to do that. But right now, uh, when we were doing our, our pre planning, it was to uh, maneuver our situation so we could onboard Matt without having to adjust. All right. Thank you. How about you, Plansky? Sean, um, Matthew talked about the challenges of learning a new offense and what could be another virtual offseason. How difficult is it to break in a new quarterback in your system when you might not be able to see him face to face? Be able to tell you after we have to do it because we've never had to do that before. So, it, you know what? I think it's about just time spent uh, efficiently and effectively getting that information communicated. And, and it's truly going to be a collaboration, Bill. Um, a lot of these things, you know, I, I think he's earned that. I think when you look at what he's accomplished, what he's done, the, the film that he has, um, you know, I'm excited about kind of picking his brain uh, and being able to collaborate based on what I've seen, you know, in the different Lions offenses, you know, with different coordinators and play callers, uh, you know, incorporate some of those things and then be able to kind of teach him some of the stuff that we've done and, and figure out how to best uh, mold it. But uh, he strikes me as an extremely intelligent guy. I'd be a quick study. He's played a lot of football. There's a lot of consistent carryover when you just look at the way that offenses operate around the league, Bill. It's kind of maybe just some of the minutia with the details and the way that you're coaching some of these plays and uh, which situations or which coverages you're trying to attack when you activate them. But, uh, you know, if, if that's the situation, that's what everyone has to deal with and, and we'll adjust and you won't hear any excuses from me on that front. All right, last one last thing. I want you to pretend you are in court and you are under oath. Does this does Matthew need a deep threat? Do you need to get a deep threat for him, or do you have one in the building? I think uh, I think so. You know the answer to that, Bill. Yeah, it seems like a low question, but uh, uh, here's what I would say: Every offense, probably in the NFL, would love a deep threat, right? And and if I add it to that, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone that you know, catches one deep ball a game. Those are, those can be low percentage throws, but it does, you know, when you definitely have uh, skilled players with juice and that can threaten the top shelf of the coverage, the uh, most defense coordinators going to want to want to ensure that top shelf. But and a lot of times that means backing some people off the ball or, or committing to two to, to cover one. And then allows some, let's call it intermediate explosives to occur. So the uh, difficult part of the equation is uh, finding those players who can actually threaten uh, NFL defenders because most, uh, most players that come to this league are fast. So uh, there is an element where, okay, you, you got to really go search and identify. And we'd all love to identify those guys that can even threaten NFL defenders. I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. Well, and I would say this too, Bill, you know, we need to be more explosive offensively, but we've been a really explosive offense with Cooper Cup, Robert Woods and Higby being centerpieces of it. And so those guys are going to continue to be that. Um, but when you talk about opportunities, got to call plays that give you an opportunity to be explosive, you know, and that's where my contribution is. And um, anytime that you have guys that can do that, that definitely is a benefit. But we have guys on our roster that have done that. You know, when you look at the big play production from those guys in particular, saw a lot of good things from some younger players that we drafted last year. But uh, we're always trying to add some juice. And, uh, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll see what the next month and a half entails. What the hell, huh? <laughs> hey, Bill, should, I just, should I just answer that yes? <laughs> yes, you should have said yes, but I'm going to write it as you said, as if you said yes. You could write, hey, we're looking for, you know, a slow, methodical, you know, 
<laughs> What's the old saying? Get a yard in a cloud of dust. You know, I don't think that's going to go over well. Not get a yard in a cloud of dust. No, that's not it, Les. That's not the. That's not the saying. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, listen. Appreciate right. you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank, Thank you. you.